I'm here with Kaylin O'Connor. Kaylin, thank you for joining me. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Kaylin, we're going to be talking about our information ecosystem and scientific and journalistic practices. Um, but I thought it'd be fun to start with a game. So before the discussion, I went onto the homepage of a well-known uh, news website called Science News Daily, and I copied a few of the headlines. Um, and I should emphasize, I didn't go digging uh, for anything specific. It was literally from the homepage. I just took a couple headlines. I want to read them out, and I would love for you, using your knowledge about curation and journalistic practices, take a guess as to you know what the article is about and just how significant the findings in that article are. So the first one is okay. titled... Uh, generative AI could break the internet, researchers find. What do you reckon that article might be about? <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, there's a lot of ways that generative AI could break the internet. That one, I, I have really very little idea. I mean, maybe something about how AI could create too much content or content that's too misleading or, I, yeah, I don't know. What What is it? Yeah. Uh, so the the actual article, I mean, it relates to that. It is about uh, feedback loops and AI training on AI generated content, sort of going off the rails. And so, um, from my perspective, breaking the internet is is quite a far cry from <laughs> what the paper is actually about. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like an example of how we often see exaggeration or clickbaity titles or things being. Um, made to sound sort of bigger than they are when mm. science journalists write up studies. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, honestly, I think there were there were probably 20 articles on that page. I've got five t titles here. I won't read I won't read all of them. Um, oh, maybe I'll just read all of them. We, we can stop the game. But scientists lay out a revolutionary method to warm Mars. Um, and this is basically about polluting the Martian atmosphere to make it warmer. Oh, <laughs> okay. Maybe we could pump our carbon over to Mars. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that's what it is. Um, uh, there is one here that says, if you snore, you could be three times more likely to die of coronavirus. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, I want to say that the pandemic was like one of the best times ever for really overly hyped and misleading clickbait titles. And this brings me back to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and a title that it was not on that page, but you would be familiar with was entitled The Best Paper You'll Read Today, uh, <laughs> which you'll know all about. Yes, because I, I helped write that paper. <laughs> um, it was, in fact, the best paper I read that day. So um, it was, was actually it not the misleading only paper? in the end. <laughs> it was also did, the only did paper you only I read, read that day. That paper? Yeah. I did. <laughs> that's, that's what I suspected. Um, but but it, it brings us very nicely to, to this topic of. Um, journalistic practices and curation because i mean science news daily is regarded by many as a, a very reliable source you know it's a, it's a source that um, reports on university research findings and people do use this uh, this source for their science news their science information um and so let's let's pull up and and discuss that concept of uh, curation um, i think it's it's for me not surprising that popular news websites can have exaggerated titles because um you know everyone is competing for attention and, and these things happen. Um, but I think these practices probably exist in a broader way in our information ecosystem than many people realize. And um, probably many of them are even implicit in, 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 in sort of hidden ways. And they could lead to very real consequences. And I, I know this is a topic that you've thought about a lot and explored a lot. Where, where else do you see this sort of phenomenon uh, happening? And, and just how big of a problem is it? Yeah, so some co-authors and I got interested in thinking about curation written very broadly because, um, I mean, we were working on things related to misinformation. There's all these attempts to control or regulate or prevent the harms of misinformation online, and that's really good. We thought then, and I still think, that curation, the way we take accurate real data, real scientific findings, real events that happen, and then just shape and select what ones people see can be just as important to understand, just as important to think about and regulate if we want people to have accurate beliefs. Um, that was how we got into that topic, this sort of lack of attention to curation. I mean, 
one of the reasons it matters so much is that there's tons and tons of things that are happening in the world all the time, every day. There's no way we can pay attention to all of them. We're only going to find out about some small portion of these. And that's going to really shape our feelings about how the world works and what's out there, right? Um, It's going to shape our beliefs about, say, how dangerous COVID is or how much climate change is happening or are windmills killing birds? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It matters as much to our beliefs or more, I think, as whether we get accurate or inaccurate information. Mm. Is it, um, do you have a sense as to how big of an issue this is in practice? I mean, it, no doubt it happens, and we've just talked about some examples on, on a particular news website. But if we had to say on, on you know, the scale of problems that are sort of impacting society <laughs> today, so how significant is this? Well, curation is happening literally all the time. You know, as I pointed out, there's so much stuff happening that we couldn't possibly know about all of it. There's so many scientific articles coming out, we can't know about all of them. So in some way, it's just of massive scale. You know, when science journalists pick out just some studies to report, when social media algorithms pick just some things to promote, when we pick just some things to tell to other people, when people write textbooks or teachers prepare courses and they just share some information, but not other information. Curation is happening in all of those places. Of course, it's not always going to be a problem. There's lots of things we don't actually need to know about. But part of what we've done in our research is pointed to a bunch of places where curation really does cause problems. And in the paper that you were mentioning, we use models to show how even really good learners, people who are ideally rational learners, could come to develop very confused views of how the world works just on the basis of curation. Mm. Well, let's let's dig into the paper then. Um, I found it very interesting. And, um, uh, you know, they, in that paper, you presented three sort of broad sort of categories of curation, hyperbole, extremity bias, fair reporting, uh, and analyzed them in turn. Um, could you run me through those different types of, of practices and, and sort of what they mean and where we might see them? Yeah, and I should make clear, you know, this paper was about science journalism in particular. So we were trying to think specifically when it comes to science journalism, what are the ways that science journalists tend to curate out of all the studies out there? What will people see? Um, So there's lots of other things that happen in curation. But of these ones, one thing um, that science journalists tend to do is try to be fair or balanced. And all journalists tend to do this. This is part of the codes of ethics and norms for good journalism. And what that means is that when you're talking about some controversial issue, you try to present the two sides either with equal weight or in a fair way. In practice, it often means just giving equal airtime or equal print space to two sides of a controversial issue. Now, generally, that's a really good norm to try to present things in a fair way because it helps you avoid things like highly partisan news or highly partisan opinion. Um, But people have pointed out that when it comes to science reporting, it can be a problem because you end up sometimes with false balance. And we saw this a lot traditionally with climate change reporting, where there's a controversy about is climate change happening or not. It's not really a scientific controversy, it's a social controversy. But to report in a fair way, people would try to present both sides of that issue, giving them equal weight. Whereas in fact, one of them had much, much more scientific evidence behind it. So that fair reporting would be kind of falsely propping up the side that's wrong, if that makes sense. So that's fairness. The other two things we talk about were less driven by journalistic norms than by the incentives that journalists face. So literally in order to be a journalist, to survive, to have a paper, um, to not be fired, you have to get attention as a journalist. If people aren't putting eyes on your column, you know, what what's your function, right? Which means that there are these huge incentives to create things that are interesting or novel or surprising or noteworthy or newsworthy and that grab people's attention. That's why we see those clickbaity headlines. Um, 
But that often shapes how journalists curate what they report on. So one thing that we talk about is what we call extremity bias, which means that when you're looking at stuff happening in the world, scientific events, you see reporting much more on things that are on the extremes, meaning they somehow surprise people. So for example, (laughs) I've just been looking at a case of like, are male and female brains inherently importantly different? Almost every study on male and female brains that measures, you know, say a lot of things, all the connections that they can measure with MRI in the brain is going to find some statistical differences and then also a lot of overlap. Um, so the truth is some in this middle space, right? But when you see reporting on it, you see people reporting on the studies that are like, we found that men's brains are just really different from women's or else. The ones being like, there is no difference between male and female brains. So these extremes get reported much more than the kind of stable middle core, if that makes sense. Hyperbole or exaggeration is also something we see driven by those incentives for attention um, to take things that are really happening and just make them sound a little more extreme or exciting. Like, we're going to warm Mars up or... (laughs) We're going to break the internet with AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's fascinating. I mean, the, the, the fair reporting example one is really interesting because, uh, you know, before thinking about this very deeply, that, that one would strike many people, I think, as the obvious best thing to do. You know, I think maybe even the, the, the language there of fair reporting is a bit misleading itself because uh, fairness uh, means something very particular in this case. But before jumping into the, the results of the paper, I mean, maybe to linger on that point a little bit, Um, You know, fair reporting, imagine yourself as a journalist choosing on what to report on. As a journalist or as a a scientist, you also don't have access to non-curated information in in some sense. I mean, so for example, reporting on climate change, there is some sort of abstract notion of the the truth of the matter and, you know, what actual evidence exists out there. Um, But really what you are reporting on as a journalist is research that's been done um, and uh, other articles that have been posted and so on. And those things are already in some sense curated in various ways. And so uh, how, how does it, how does the journalist, if they wanted to even do something like fair reporting, how, how would they even think about approaching, you know, <laughs> taking an accurate sample of the sort of like underlying truth space versus this curated world that is in front of them? Yeah, I mean, that is a massively difficult problem. It's one that we in this work kind of ignore, which is, as you're pointing out, the stuff that gets produced in science is itself already shaped by all sorts of things. The values of scientists and the values of funding agencies, you know, what does the NSF want to fund or whoever? Um, and just randomness, you know, what, what did people happen to work on? What study did they happen to produce? You know, all of that shapes the science that already exists. I can't even begin to say how hard it is to somehow think we could create science that's sort of perfectly sampling from the things in the world. I would say we got to just put that aside, starting from the point of view of like a science journalist what do you have? You have some set of scientific studies out there, right? Um, That's what you have to draw on. You know, in some ways, those are already going to be distorted, but that's your best starting point. In thinking about fair reporting, usually what you want to do is not to try to think of something as controversial, where there's a yes and a no side, and then you're going to give those equal weight. But you want to ask, you know, what sorts of evidence exists in what distributions, and what would be the most accurate way to report that. So for example, in the pandemic, there was a lot of reporting on how dangerous is COVID? What's the infection fatality rate? And sometimes you'd see, you know, an article being like, a new study found that it was way lower than we thought, or a new study found it was way higher than we thought. What you would want to do there to be fair or balanced is look at all the studies and then give some sort of overview of like, across all these studies, what's the distribution? How trustworthy are those different studies? Were they well done or poorly done? What was the average? Um, That would be the best way to be fair to the data that exists. Yeah, Um, not not to get too deeply into the sort of um, uh, 
replication crisis, rabbit hole, and those sort of things. But you know, e even in the cases of meta-analyses that do look at, let's say, thousands of studies that have been done, maybe many small, low-powered studies, you know, in drawing inferences, there there is also that issue of the, the boring studies that didn't have any interesting findings never making it to publication and and so the whole meta-analysis itself is you know terribly skewed um to towards the extremes uh, how, how does a how does a science communicator think about um uh, sort of not being caught out by by that issue yeah so i mean what you're talking about people sometimes call the file drawer effects where um if you're studying some topic say you get a finding that's not very interesting or you it's not statistically significant you know you don't find any association between two things um does this cause cancer well sometimes you just don't get any sort of clear answer out of your data you find no link um and then a lot of times those things don't get published. It's that journals like things that have like positive associations. So when people are doing meta-analyses, there are techniques they use sometimes to try to recover the missing data. You know, one thing people will do is look at a whole distribution of findings and they'll say, okay, if we see these ones printed that were statistically significant in this direction and these that were statistically significant in that direction, we can infer that there was something in between that just never got printed and we can try to, you know, get some signal out of the noise there. Um, that is really complicated to do. I don't think it's something we should expect just your everyday science journalist in any way to be able to do to try to infer from the data that exists plus this file drawer effect what data should be there. Um, of course, it is when you when you can look at a meta-analysis or a review paper where someone's already done that, that is usually a pretty good source of accurate information to share or report on. Yeah, okay, well, let, let's uh, let's dig into the to the paper and the um, the model and the inferences that we can draw from them. Um, so, as we said, it, the, the paper is <laughs> titled The Best Paper You'll Read Today. Um, and we, we looked at those three categories of curation, um, I don't know, curation is, is the right word for all of them, but hyperbole, extremity bias, and fair reporting. Um, could you give me a, an overview of the, um, the model and, um, and then the inferences that we can, can draw from the, from the model? Yeah, so what we wanted to do with this paper was set up a situation where otherwise we would expect, so we're modeling science journalists, right? We're modeling some series of information they're drawing from. And in our model, we're just assuming like the information they get is accurate. They're getting a good distribution of data. We're just ignoring the possibility that as we were talking about that science is already distorting data. Um, so we say they start with access to great data. Then they're going to report to people who are really good learners, people who, if they get good reporting, are going to be able to learn how the world works. And then we just add to that the possibility of curation. Now just make this journalist fair in this particular both sides equal weight type of way, or just make this journalist an extreme reporter. They only report the extremes of events that happen or make them a little bit hyperbolic. They report a real event, but they just make it a little more extreme or novel or surprising. Um, so the strategy was to say, set up an otherwise perfect scenario, then just add this possibility curation and see how it messes up learning and then of course indeed it does it does mess up learning yeah yeah fascinating well let's 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 dig into some of the implications so let's take for example um the uh, fair reporting so again the, a good example here is, is uh, climate change um you know media outlets science reporters who let's say only report um evidence that there, you know, there is human-made climate change are often told that um, they are not giving the other side uh, any sort of airtime. Um, but of course, you know, almost all climate scientists fall on the side of thinking that there is anthropogenic climate change. And so, you know, equal distribution of airtime would, would mean very little um, for, for the side that says there isn't. Um, so suppose that journalist then makes, makes that adjustment and does give somewhat uh, of, you know, equal airtime air time or something like it to both sides. Um, in, in this model, what is, the, what is the implication? What is the result of that type of curation? 
Yeah, so what we find is this can end up with people just having a distorted picture of the average sort of thing happening in the world. So there's something that's like a little technical I have to explain about the model, which is that we're saying these journalists, they're looking at some series of events. Like we could imagine those events are this temperature in Melbourne and that temperature in Madrid and that temperature wherever, you know, these different temperatures. They're going to report these and they're going to try to do it in some way that's like fair, right? Um, we assume in the model that there's some social idea about what counts as fair. And when we look at climate change, the place people drew that line, what counts as fair, was the line like, is it happening or is it not? Basically, the line was like zero degrees of average warming. And it would be fair to report evidence on one side of that and evidence on the other side of that and give them equal weight. So we assume there's like a fair line set up by society. Then we say, okay, the journalists are going to report stuff from either side of that fair line equally. And basically what it does is it makes people think that the world is kind of closer to what this fair line is than it really is, right? So in the climate change case, that would be people coming away thinking like, we're closer to expecting zero degrees of warming than we really are when, it, you know, the actual expectation should be whatever, two degrees of warming by this date, Um and so they're kind of they're kind of pulled back into the social expectation that already exists in that case. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, it, I don't know if you've looked in, in sort of actual real world practical examples of this. I mean, this is what the what the the model says, and it points to a very clear picture. And we've talked about climate change, but are there particular examples of this that you've seen? where we can actually say, well, look, this does pan out in the real world. This has happened. Um, you know, we can, can point to it and, and, and we're seeing this actually happening. Well, I mean, I think climate change really is one of those cases. There was a reason everyone got upset about fair reporting in climate change for that very reason. Journalists have become much more aware of this and much better at not doing it over the last decade or so. Um, in part because of like the 2016 election. And so I don't know that I can pull out of my hat like another great example. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's okay. Um, let, let's look at um, the um, hyperbole example then, because again, I think this is, I think this is one that is very obviously <laughs> present everywhere. Um, basically everything that, that you, you read online is going to um, be impacted in some way by a bit of um, hyperbole or exaggeration, a anything that is trying to attract a reader attention. Um, so we'll have, we'll have somewhat of, uh, of this. There is even an argument from a scientific perspective that, you know, if you can imagine good science reporting competing against the universe of all other information out there, um, maybe it's even a, a good thing to be a little bit hyperbolic if it attracts uh, viewership and makes it entertaining because, you know, it is providing better education than what else is out there. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, there are negative consequences to exaggerating things. Um, what, did the, what did the model find on the topic of uh, hyperbole? Yeah, so what we found, and of course we modeled hyperbole in this really particular way where mm. we said, okay, once again, there are social expectations for what's going to happen in the world. And to make something hyperbolic is to take some real thing that happened and kind of push it away from those social expectations. So maybe we expect that the fire season in California this year is so bad. And then when you report it, you're like, it was even worse than that, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so when reporters are doing that, what we find is that the people getting that information end up thinking the world is just more extreme than it actually is, which is sort of what you'd expect, right? Mm. So people think like, wow, we're having a lot of really terrible fire seasons, and then a lot that just like don't even show up as a blip on my radar. Um, or, you know, extreme weather events are just much more common than mm. you would have thought they were, it could be another thing you could come away with. Or instances of extreme violence are much more common than you would have thought. So basically, people end up sort of seeing the world as distorted out towards these events that in reality tend to be pretty rare. Did, did you look in the model um, of, you, you know, again, you have this, this imagined journalistic layer that has a real access to the actual underlying distribution of things and reports on it to 
learners who learn perfectly and because because of the curation they develop these distorted views did you model out the effects at all of well actually you know those those consumers are also journalists um if you think about it the journalists are also consuming that and and so they you know you can iterate that forward and um uh, you know the, the you can imagine just layers and layers of reporting which is actually what happens um what happens after sort of many iterations of this type of of curation and and how um you know because th there is a question as to just how significant each one of these things is and which ones are most sensitive and which ones aren't and you, you can imagine if we were to tune our journalistic practices being aware of all of these different things how would we choose to tune them and, and where should we be most worried um did you did you look at um at that uh, sort of iterative curation at all so could you clarify for me what's iterating there the journalists learn something and then so like, imagine yeah, the journalist the... In, in the initial stage phase of the model you imagine the journalist has actual um, access to the true underlying distribution of things and they curate and report on that this defines a new distribution which is reported on again <laughs> and again um, you know you can imagine it's news news media picking up uh, what other journalists have said and and so on and so on and eventually down the track most of the reported content would actually have gone through multiple layers of this curation have we you, did you not model that no i and i'm not sure what would happen i mean you know our strategy was like what we want to do is really isolate just this one little thing that you would mm. think that's not so bad, like not so mm. bad to report fairly or not so bad to report the extremes. Who cares about anything but the extremes of stuff that happens? Um, so we didn't look at that. One thing we did look at was slightly imperfect consumers, which what we modeled were people who engage in confirmation bias, which is a type of reasoning bias that we all engage in where we're more likely to trust or believe information that fits with what we already believe. Mm -hmm. And in that version of the model, we made it so that um, the people learning from these science reports, if they heard something that already made sense with their picture of the world, they'd be more likely to change their beliefs on the basis of that, more likely to learn from that. Mm -hmm. And they'd be less likely to learn from things that didn't fit with their picture of the world. And so in that way, they can kind of double, they tend to double down on what they already believed. And that was interesting because in that sort of scenario, when you have people reporting extreme things or um, engaging in hyperbole, you end up where everyone can kind of double down on what they already believe in anyway. Like you already think climate change is happening. Will you see a lot of reporting saying that it is. You already think it's not happening. You see lots of reporting saying it, saying it isn't. You think that vaccines are safe. You see a lot of reporting on that. You think vaccines are dangerous. You see these like stories about any worry about vaccine harms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one variation we looked at with these kind of like a little more realistic dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a very relevant one and, uh, and uh, um, one that we do see in the real world a lot. I mean, it's not, not exactly confirmation bias, but it's related. You know, there's also the question of whether one trusts or to the degree to which one trusts various sources, um, even to the extent where if one distrusts a particular source, one could, <clears throat> and that source reports accurate information, um, one could actually actively then dist distrust that. So as an example, um, if you fall on one side of a political line, um, let's say you're in the, in the States, you're sort of diehard Democrat and Fox News reports on something which might be true. Um, uh, you're, it's sort of like a disconfirmation bias. You, you, you have this um, inherent assumption that this is not a trustworthy source and that can actually push you further away from, uh, from the truth. So I, d I definitely think that's one you see playing out um, a lot in the real world. There's a couple of things going on in there and what you just said. So, I mean, confirmation bias and like what people call the backfire effect, um, they're about the way people respond to evidence that they get or information that they get. So does is this information stuff I tend to believe or disbelieve? And there's it's a kind of controversial, but some people do find that people actually, like if they get stuff that goes against their beliefs will sometimes like 
dig in their heels, like go further in the other direction on these polarized topics like climate change or vaccines. Um, what you were talking about, though, is also something different, like s trust in sources, right? Uh, how I respond to a person who's sharing something with me based on, like, do I think they're part of my in-group or out-group, or do I trust them, or do I think they're an expert or not? Um, and one thing I think is really interesting that you pointed out is this kind of phenomenon where a really mistrusted source by saying something can make you almost doubt that thing more. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, this is going really technical, but, um, you know, there, there, I think there is this belief that people have where as long as everybody has access to the same information, then our, our um, beliefs and views of the world will converge. And it kind of, it feels, it feels intuitive. Um, but there is a very well-known probability textbook by E.T. Jaynes uh, where he gives an example where he says, well, so imagine two people with different priors uh, where one distrusts the information source and one trusts them. And that source presents them the same information. What happens to their worldviews? And um, they, they actually diverge because they, they interpret that information differently, which is really interesting. I, I don't know if it has practical implications for journalistic curation practices, um, but it means even presenting uh, information in a, in a particular way could lead to different people receiving it um, differently and, and diverging in their worldviews on that basis, which is quite counterintuitive. Yeah, I think that that's right and that that can happen. It can even happen for other reasons, just having more to do with in-groupism and out-groupism and mm. these trust dynamics between people. And an elite just shared that with me. You know, should I ever believe anything an elite says or whatever? Or um, someone on the opposite political team. Uh, to some degree, you know, I think it just can't be on science journalists <laughs> to try to game out what nutty things people are going to do. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that at the end of the day, if you're a journalist or someone who's preparing information for the public, like you should do it in the most responsible way you can. And then that's all you can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree. We can't always put it on the on the shoulders of the science communicators. Um, I guess it, it does. It does draw um, up the question, though, you know, as, as a science communicator, what, what is the best thing to do? What, what is the is there sort of like a theoretically um, correct way to, to do, do curation. Um, and, and again, there are other considerations um, versus just accurate information um, sort of dissemination because, um, again, like a, a journalist does want their, um, you know, if they think, they think they've got important science to communicate, they do want people to read it. So it should be interesting. It should be written well. Um, so how, how do you think about that, that problem um, and, and whether there is sort of like are there other theoretically correct principles? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I tend to think like if, if you're doing science journalism, hopefully you're writing on a topic where if you present the survey, the data in that area in a way that's accurate and gives context and sort of tracks things in a balanced way. Hopefully you can still do that in a way that's interesting. So I think there should be just much more focus on reporting on some kind of consensus or an emerging understanding rather than reporting on, say, individual studies or particular events. Because when you do the first thing, usually you can give an understanding that's more nuanced, that's going to be more accurate, that's already emerged out of a scientific literature, a whole process of scientists coming to understand the world, you know. Um, they've already done tons of tests on climate change or on vaccines or whatever it is, and then you can report on the good understanding that's come out. The thing I think people generally shouldn't be doing is selecting like one study without the proper context without an understanding of what are the other studies in that literature and then just reporting on that. So that kind of practice during the COVID-19 pandemic was extremely harmful and misleading. There was an example where, you know, this California research team found an extremely low infection fatality rate and that just their one study got reported all over the place because it was very exciting because it wasn't what people expected. It was at the extremes of what people would expect. 
there are lots of ways to present things in an interesting way where you're still covering like a whole area. Like here's the things scientists as a group have come to figure out about the way trees grow. <laughs> Maybe that that's interesting to me. That's probably not a good example of things that are interesting to other people. But I, I think you see what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I do, I do. Um, well, let's maybe let's pull up from the case of a particular science journalist, let's say, and and to institutions, because um, I feel like the the rules maybe play out a little bit differently at that level. Um, and one one sort of analogy that comes to mind here, if I were to take something like um, the medical industry or the pharmaceutical industry, you know, to to get a new drug or a new medical device to market or something um a lot needs to happen um it needs often there is like a theoretical step you have to have some theoretical basis for believing that this thing will, will work and is safe and there would be often um, some modeling work involved similar to what we've just talked about from the curation basis and then there might be actual real world clinical trials and so on and eventually if there's a strong enough belief that this thing is good and safe you might get the new drug with the new device um, to market um when it comes to things like um, curation algorithms, you know, things that would, for example, um, curate one's social media feed, you know, there is no such process that works as way well, to, to my knowledge. Um, you know, the, these things are just like let out into the world. Um, and I, I'm not even sure the, the extent to which these companies really, really do think about the impacts in the same way as, as you've done in your in your work, do you think that there is space for something like that? You know, some sort of again, if you treat the treat, treat the curation algorithm as a <laughs> as a new medical device, just as an, as an example, you know, um, is there space? Is there need for the the kind of work that you've done, looking at how the different algorithms could lead to different um, sort of imp you know impacts in the world before these things are released out there? I mean. We would hope that <laughs> the people running social media platforms, before they make a new algorithm, before mm. they make whatever other changes to their platform, would think really hard first about how is this going to impact users? How is mm. it going to impact the spread of information? Is it going to create a problem for disinformation? Whatever. Um, I think sometimes they do. but. As you're pointing out, it's not like we have any regulatory body that's saying you have to do that. You have to be careful how your algorithm works. You have to figure out what impacts it's going to have before you use it. Um, if we want to keep up the medical analogy, that used to be true of medicine, too. There wasn't always an FDA. Um, and before we had government regulation of drugs, there were a lot of people creating all sorts of wild things that they were giving to patients or selling as cures for diseases that were sometimes they didn't work and sometimes they would actually hurt you or sometimes they had mercury in them or, <laughs> or um, cocaine or whatever. Uh, so we might think that what we're going to want for social media is to have something like the FDA, but where what it does is works with platforms to say whatever you're rolling out or um, whatever new challenges you're facing, we're going to work with you so that you comply with certain standards to protect users from misinformation or the spread of bad information or bad curation or whatever it is. Yeah, I guess for people to take the idea of um, I mean, for, for people to not be so resistant to the idea of, of regulation this, um, in this way, you have to believe that the consequences of not regulating are significant enough. And again, to, to take the medical analogy even further, you know, there are cases where, let's say the case of thalidomide, for example, um, this is a case where, um, for, for people who don't know, um, you know, drug used for morning sickness and Many, many years later, it transpired that it was um, it also resulted in um, sort of genetic defects and and children born with you know merged arms and things like that, uh, and so it was it was very delayed. You know the drug in market used in the real world, and then the consequences emerged down the track, and and then after that the regulation came in. Uh, but there are other cases where just on a purely theoretical basis we know um, now based on the knowledge that 
it's, it's likely to be dangerous. So again, you mentioned mercury. Now that we know that mercury is poisonous to humans, um, we know that already. We don't have to go and do clinical trials with things that are very mercury-laden. We know um, based, on, based, on, um, based on theory alone uh, that drugs shouldn't contain too high levels of mercury. Um, and I, I wonder in the case of um, the, the sort of curation algorithms then, do, do we know enough purely on a theoretical basis to justify very seriously looking at, um, at regulation in, again, to, to suppose there were just those three types of curation that we've talked about, um, you know, a hyperbole, extremity bias, fair reporting. Just imagine that the, the algorithms just had some blend of those things. On a purely theoretical basis, do we, do we know um, enough based on the sort of modeling work that you've done and so on that regulation would be would be necessary? Well, I just want to point out, I I never have thought and do not think that social media algorithms rather than journalists themselves mm. are like are facing the same incentives as journalists or curate yes. in the same way that journalists do. I don't think that. Mm. I do think they tend to select for extreme content of certain sorts, but it wouldn't be in the same way as science journalists. Mm. Um, now, just kind of stepping back and getting at like more the heart of that question. Certainly we know that there are, there are and have been extremely serious harms from internet disinformation, things that have killed people and, you know, harm democracy, stuff like mm -hmm. this. Uh, you know, in the U S a lot, a lot of people have taken ivermectin to treat COVID. You know, it doesn't mm. treat COVID and it's not supposed to be for humans. This is a dangerous thing to do. You know, again, in the U.S., we had uh, an insurrection on the U.S. Capitol in part driven by QAnon conspiracy content online. So we know that real harms can come out of social media misinformation. Um I would think that alone is enough to think we need to take regulation seriously. I think, you know, when people feel scared or resistant, when we talk about social media regulation, it's because of free speech laws and free speech norms. And free speech is an incredibly important thing to protect in any country. But when it comes to things like a social media algorithm, and this isn't my point, this is something many people have pointed out, uh, they're already making choices. It's not like you're just getting some magical, perfect bubble of speech of whatever is random selection of what everyone's saying. It's picking things to show you and not show you. And some things are getting platformed and some things are getting deplatformed. So it's already making all these choices. The question is, do we want to have controls who care about public health, who care about democratic functioning, who are saying, once you have these algorithms shaping what people see what information gets sent out to people, what gets curated. Um, do we want that to be done in a way that's good for us, the users? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would have to get into the specifics there, but maybe just lingering on the point of the, the incentive system. So you, you mentioned you're not claiming the incentives faced by scientists, journalists are the same as the incentives that um, sort of shape social media algorithms. Um, are, are there... And presu presumably, like there are some incentives that are very helpful, and some that are not, and some that are worse than others. Are there any sort of um, uh, sort of specific or very material ways that you feel that they differ that are that are important? Yeah. Well, so first of all, you know, these social media algorithms don't face like ethical norms the way science scientists do. So something mm. like fair reporting is completely out the window. I do think there tends to be selection for extreme content, where extreme are the things that are surprising to people, what they think about the world right now. So I think that actually is quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's something that I think is quite different is that there have been studies showing that the algorithms on some social media platforms tend to actively select misleading information or false information to promote compared to accurate mm -hmm. information. And the reason that happens is that often misinformation is more surprising because it's false. Um, 
So it tends to be stuff that seems weirder and people are more interested in, and then the algorithm picks up on that. Whereas I think science journalists tend to be the opposite. You know, of course they want to make things more exciting and they want to report the, you know, novel or extreme si science, but they're choosing things that are by and large accurate and good information to report on. So there are real disanalogies there. Do, do, do you feel like, it, well, how much of a problem is it that we might not fully understand what is actually happening within a very complicated curation algorithm versus um, what's happening with the science journalist? Again, with the science journalist, you could speak to them. <laughs> they could explain it. They might not actually faithfully rep represent what is actually happening in this sort of curation practice. But I think we have a much, much more insight than we would if it's just a very, very large black box algorithm. Um, I mean, how, how big of an issue is, is that? Just the pure fact that it, it, these things are very opaque and very complicated and we don't really know how they're working under the hood. Yeah, I mean, I think that is an issue. In some cases, you know, we can get under the hood information about algorithms. I can't remember if it was Twitter. I mean, someone at some point released like, here's how our algorithm works. But the other thing about social media systems is that they aren't just algorithms. You know, it's a system where you have sometimes millions of users. They have connections between each other. They're interacting with content in ways that then is shaping whether the algorithm picks it up. So it's this extremely complicated extended system where you have real humans, you have this online platform, you have a set of rules, you have a computer algorithm, sometimes you have AI involved in that as well. And so it, for that reason, it is really hard to understand like what's getting picked to go where and why in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, again, like, um, and none of this is sort of new thinking, but, you know, different social media platforms, all of them are living in, in a world where the, the businesses are driven by attention and attracting users and so like the, the, the whole existence of these businesses does require that um, and uh, they are in a sense all, all competing on that basis um, and so there are, you know there are certain sort of business constraints business considerations um, but but even given that are, are there things that you think um, again like back to the, back to principles are, are there any things that you think could change? that would both allow these businesses to operate as successful businesses, but also lead to meaningful improvement in what they're doing to our information environment? Yes, I do. Um, so <laughs> it's funny. I was just talking to someone about like, well, could we have some kind of neutral algorithms or neutral news feeds that that aren't distorting content in whatever way, or potentially harmful ways. And the answer is like, well, social media would be much more boring if we yeah. tried to do that. <laughs> exactly. And when platforms have tried to do that, they've been pretty boring. Um, and so obviously, like both platforms and users don't want that. But if we're thinking about what we have right now, certainly we can take what we have right now and make it better. And there's a lot of ways we can make it better. And there are things that various platforms have done that already have done that, like, for example, community notes or context notes on things. Um, you know, these will be added information. So they're, it's not a threat to free speech. They're not taking stuff down. They're adding information, giving context to, the, to whatever you're seeing. I think of that as, I think these are great. And, you know, if we sort of turn back to the curation project, in a way, those things are often giving information about like, what's the rest of the distribution of events? What are the other things that happened? How can we help you better interpret this limited piece of data you're seeing? Um, those are great. So that's just one example of something that actually has been added that has improved social media sites. Another thing I think, you know, it's been very well established that most really misleading content tends to come from a small number of users. I think that most sites should just have rules saying, like when you sign up, you sign an agreement that says, if I send around too much highly inaccurate content, I'm just removed from the site. You know, it, it's just an agreement that this is the kind of space where you have to not share too much highly misleading stuff. Um, I think that's a change that every social media platform should make. I also think when we're talking about curation, there are 
ways that you can try to make your algorithm um, track distributions of information in more like less misleading ways. So for example, it's well established that high emotion content tends to get picked up and amplified by algorithms, right? Because it's interesting. And so here it's a little hard to get rid of that because people like high emotion content. But you could make your algorithm just a little less interesting, you know, take that really angry stuff and just send it a little less far or, you know, promote the high emotion joy content, which people also like a little more. Um, sorry, we're getting away from science journalism for, for sure, <laughs> right. but right. I, I have lots of thoughts about all sorts of <laughs> misinformation. So maybe if you want, we can kind of come back on topic. No, no, no. no is there, I think, 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 I don't think that there is a, I don't think we have to confine ourselves to science journal. I, like, the posture I take is like follow the, follow where the interesting conversation goes and what's most important. So no, for sure. We, let's let's go there. <laughs> I mean, have, have have there been any practical examples that you've seen again sticking with with social media? It, or it doesn't have to be social media, but of this concept where there have been active measures taken across different platforms, and then we've had time to see the results. Um, so again, like not all social media platforms are are equal. It's it's notoriously known that the TikTok's algorithm is extremely addictive for users compared to some of the others, and um, uh, you know. Different, different platforms have tried different things. Ha have we seen any real world results of I these changes being made in certain areas and then what happened um, as, as a result? It's a little hard to know because uh, it's hard to study when one platform like makes a specific change in this highly complicated system where people are on multiple platforms and all this stuff is happening. It's hard to know exactly what happened. I think there are a few cases where you could say like, we saw a platform decision and an impact. So, for example, in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, a lot of platforms kicked off QAnon posters um, and kind of the leaders of that movement. And that seemed a lot of people thought, based on the evidence that they could gather after that, that that actually had a measurable impact on the ability of that community to spread the misinformation they were peddling and to organize. And so... That's a kind of extreme example where you're like, yeah, what the platforms did really did have an impact, but obviously that wouldn't be the kind of thing we're usually talking about. But a lot of people do do studies where they try to get, you know, a controlled population and check how certain types of changes on platforms would then impact that group. So um, one thing that's interesting that a lot of people have studied is friction on social media platforms, which is where you make it just a little harder to share things like you add friction to people's behaviors. And I think this is pretty well confirmed by the evidence that just adding friction tends to decrease how much people share false content or bad content. And so when you slow people down a little bit, it turns out they're actually not that bad at identifying what is going to be misinformation and just a little more thinking they tend not to share it even better is stuff like you know these little alerts you get on some sites being like you didn't actually read this article <laughs> are you sure you want to share it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> are you sure you want to repost it or whatever uh, and so there are some things that from experimental evidence it seems that they can actually improve sharing or make a difference there's mm. some platforms yeah. though i mean it's very hard to study platforms like tiktok where the content is videos because the content is like mm. more complex than what you might get on these other platforms where it's words or words in a picture um and so i think when we're looking at TikTok, and I think kind of video content is the future for the next while. Um, it's much less understood, I think, how to stop or decrease the spread of misinformation on that kind of platform. Yeah, and I, I guess the, the flip side that we haven't really talked about in all this, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the role of the curators themselves, whether it's a journalist, whether it's an institution, whether it's a platform. Um, we haven't spoken that much about the actions that can be taken by the consumers of that information, so the the learners. Um, 
and the users of the of these platforms um which is the, another side of, of the coin i mean do you have views on um you know what are the things that individuals for example can do to i guess protect themselves from some of the consequences uh, that we've been talking about, um, you know, you being impacted by hyperbole, um, extremity bias, all these things. Does it does anything stand out uh, from the individual perspective? Yeah. So there certainly are things users can do to improve issues around misinformation. That side of things is not usually the one I like to focus on. And the way I think about it so I think that it's just not that effective for us all to try to learn to be like really information savvy compared to just having good information environments we live in. And for me, the analogy I like to think about is everyone carrying metal straws. I don't know if you, this was a big thing in the people around Briefly me because I hang well. out with yeah. love. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I hang out with a lot of environmentalists. It was like, no more plastic straws. Everyone get your own metal straw. And it's like, or we could just have regulation around what kind of one use plastic people are allowed to produce. And if we did that one change to the whole system, we don't all have to do this really stupid thing with them carrying our own metal straws. Um, so people can learn a lot about how misinformation works. They can learn how to share less information. People should do that. It's not like there's any reason not to do that, but it's just so much more effective to have changes in government or regulation or on platforms that protect, you know, a million users at once, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. No, for, for sure it does. Um... Then let's then let's think about then you know how this might pan out in in the future. So I think I think people do have the sense that this problem has gotten a lot worse over the past decade or so. I don't I don't actually know if that's if that's true. Do, do you know is is it has someone looked at that how much worse it actually has gotten or you know do we just feel it's worse? Is it a worse problem than it was before? You know I I think it is. I don't know of. Um... Yeah, I don't know of like actual empirical data where people did real studies looking at how much disinformation is mm. there or how bad are algorithms. But part of the reason I think it's gotten worse is that, you know, when these new areas of media were created, I just think people had not yet realized how mm. much they could be used for the purposes of disinformation and then had not yet built up the skills and tools necessary to use them in that way. And you also see all these things happening where, for example, after um, the Brexit vote in 2016 and after the U.S. 2016 election, uh, where it was really coming on the public scene that disinformation was happening and might be impacting these big political events, you saw a bunch of users taking up all those practices for themselves, you know, people quite self-consciously being like, oh, well, if other people can do that, I can do that too. So I, I think that there's lots of reason to think that, in fact, it, it has gotten worse. Just more people have realized this is something they could do. Um, the techniques people have been able to use have gotten more savvy over time. At the same time, we increasingly see attempts to prevent or regulate the harms of disinformation. So there is pressure on the other side of this system um, trying to improve things. Yeah. yeah and I guess the, the critical question is which side will will win over and, and like where is the pressure mounting more um you know it, it it feels from my perspective that there is a huge degree of uncertainty about how things will pan out because you know on the one hand there is this increased awareness of, of how big the problem is um but on the other hand there is also a lot going on out there in the world um you, you know we talked about generative ai breaking the internet there, there is a lot of content out there that is generated by now generative generative ai um and it's it's very hard to spot it's very easy to to publish content there's very low friction um to get content spread all over the world uh, in a very scalable way and so it feels like there is a, a great tension between these two um sides uh how how uh, optimistic are you i guess as to how this might play out how, how do you see it playing out 
Yeah, I guess I kind of have an, a mix of optimism and pessimism. Um, there's always been misinformation as long as there have been humans. Uh, you know, whenever people can transfer information from one person to another, they're sometimes going to be sharing things that are false or misleading. So it's not like that's going away. I think the question just is sort of how bad is it or how much is it happening at at a scale that's unlike things that have come before. Um, the optimistic thing is that if you look at the history of media, I think you see a lot of cases where uh, there are new information technologies like better printing presses or new kinds of newspapers or whatever, or the radio, um, then you see the spread of misinformation via these new technologies. And then you see people kind of figuring out how to regulate it or protect themselves or develop new norms to solve those social problems. So there's like this history of people solving this same kind of problem. Uh, the pessimism part comes from the fact that the speed of digital technology change is just so fast now that it's not just that social media was invented, it's that every few years there's a new platform that people are jumping into. You know, there was Facebook and then there was Twitter and then there was Instagram and then there was WhatsApp and then there was TikTok. And, um, and each one of these is different. You know, they have different rules for how information can be shared. They have different sorts of information being shared. You know, the difference between TikTok where everything is videos and there's all these specific rules for how people can stitch with others or repeat things or copy them. Uh, the difference between that and something like Twitter, where it's whatever 200 characters of text and maybe a picture or a link is very different. So I think the question is, can we figure out how to regulate or control misinformation given all of these new platforms constantly emerging? Mm -hmm. Are there, are there any um, emerging technologies that you think will be sort of particularly important to to think about and, and focus on in this space? I mean, gen generative AI is a very big, it's a very broad term. It means a lot of things. Um, but, uh, you know, automatically generated video content is an example of something that they can do. Um, we've seen deep fakes. We've seen very, very personalized content. Does there anything, is there anything that jumps out to you as particularly troublesome in this uh, in this fast moving space i mean i i honestly am not sure and i'm not really an ai person uh one thing that a lot of people have worried about which seems right to me is that when you can make generative ai it decreases people's trust in all sorts of content so now people become much less sure if a video they're seeing was a real video or if it was an ai video or if a photo could be a deep fake and so it decreases the information value in normal media in a way that seems worrying. What I'm guessing, just based on how things are gone, is that we just are not going to have any idea what the real threats are until they happen. Uh, I think we're going to look back in 10 years and be like, wow, we, we just really weren't expecting that. I mean, that's that's what's happened on the internet at every stage. Uh we thought it was going to help us never be wrong again. <laughs> and then that's really not what happened. Uh, or, you know, with the origins of Facebook, it was like, oh, this is going to be a fun little silly thing for the youth to connect with their friends on. And then social media just became something totally different from what we would have expected. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's it's tricky. Um, I mean, I, what, what do you do uh, personally? to navigate this space and to protect yourself again there's some obvious things you know trusted sources do somewhat of your own research and so on but is there anything that that you incorporate in, in your sort of personal life and in professional life to so sort of navigate this effectively yeah i mean when it comes to news i pay attention to source quite a lot and tend to go with mainstream news sources you know the washington post or whatever, something of that sort. I think the the place, you know, I'm, I'm a person who does like misinformation <laughs> research. So I tend to know <laughs> more about like how to deal with particular kinds of misleading content. Yes. I think the place that even for me is extremely challenging actually 
goes back to curation, but now curation based on preferences, right? Mm -hmm. Where like everyone else, I tend to see the content that tickles me that I find enjoyable or uplifting or confirming of my worldview. Um, And that means that there are a lot of things I'm not seeing, especially on the other side of the political aisle, and I'm not seeing the opinions that really differ from my own. And, you know, I try to kind of extrapolate out in my mind, like, remember, you know, this is just my echo chamber. There's all this other stuff I'm missing, but I find that extremely hard. Um, It's actually a place where I, I worry. I don't think I can do it. I sort of don't think anyone can do it to really understand what's going on outside of their own little bubble when you're only seeing what's in your bubble. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I worry about that too. I mean, going back to your your um, the original paper we were talking about, one of the key assumptions there for that in, the, in that model was that the journalists were getting an accurate, they had access to sort of an accurate representation of the underlying distribution. And, and I feel like be, before the digital age, at least to some extent, this was true in the sense that information came through kind of geographically constrained networks. You would bump into people on the street, you knew people in your area. You know, of course, you could get bubbles within the village. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think the environment forced a, a somewhat of a, a sort of a bigger spread of, of the ideas we would get exposed to versus, as you said, today where, with a high degree of personalization based on individual preferences. It's almost it's almost impossible to, for for one to know, um, you know, to to what extent they're now what they're seeing as much as, as your own research as as you want to do, um, you know, how does one know whether this is getting somewhat of a, a an accurate sampling of the underlying truth space? <laughs> and I, I, I'm not trying to solve that problem, but it's something I worry about as well. Yeah, how quirky an individual is the information or the opinions or whatever that you yourself are seeing is just hard to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, if you think about like pre-internet information spread, it's not that this wasn't a problem. It was just that it was a different problem. You know, people mm. were, as you say, more influenced by their geographic locations and the people there. And there are really interesting, like formative studies showing that that's the case. For example, I think there was one on MIT students in their little like housing groups that showed people would have more similar beliefs the cl- when they lived closer to each other um so you're still having some kinds of like mm-hmm. effects of space but now space is different now space has to do with these virtual environments and how close you are in virtual space rather than your literal physical environments mm. yeah and I, and I think there is also i mean, I mean one, one of the biases of curation that you talked about was the extremity bias or or maybe like cherry picking is a better example here where there is a lot of stuff going out in the world and you know previously um you know you could sample events all day and you just simply would not get exposed to the number of extreme events as we do today today because the information that we're getting is is globalized i think it is possible to spend all day every day just getting a, a sample of very very extreme events on any particular topic and I don't know if our psychology can uh, <laughs> can quite really unwind just how skewed that distribution is. And I'm not sure if we're, we're able to do that. Yeah. And I think even with traditional media, that was something people were worried about. You know, uh, do people have a really um, skewed view of how common crime is, for example, because crime gets reported so often. And then on social media you can go even further on this. Like if you're, if you're interested in situations where like a cat mom raises squirrel babies, you can go find a hundred videos today of that and maybe get a really skewed distribution of how often that happens. I don't know on my, on my social media sites that happens surprisingly often so now i kind of have an idea that like there's a lot of cats raising squirrels and a lot of chickens with little kittens under them <laughs> yeah well uh, i almost i almost introed almost suggest that we intro this conversation by comparing our news feeds on social media sites but I thought that it was probably <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was probably a bit risky 
<laughs> yeah, it's a little risky. <laughs> it would definitely reveal my political preferences more than I try to do in like professional spaces. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the other the other interesting thing there is that um, uh, you know, a, a quite a small sample of of what people are receiving on their curated sites can reveal a lot about their political preferences and and other preferences because of of how, how tightly these things cluster, which is is maybe maybe a, a topic for a <laughs> for a different conversation, but also also an issue. Yeah, um, one of the places where I personally um, try to get sort of higher quality, like well curated information is, of course, books. Um, I think you know people spend a lot of time uh, to develop a, a a book that's well written, um, and books have been absolutely critical for my life and i'm sure i mean you've, you've you're the author of, of many papers and and some books as well um i'd love to turn to the the topic of of books um and if you have any books that jump to mind that have most influenced you in your in your professional or personal life that's like such a matt that's like such a big topic jump Especially oh, when you uh, threw personal life in there, and I'm just like reeling. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's yeah, iterate. To, let's let's iterate. To, let's let's do let's do something that's much more closely related to the yeah, um, yeah the professional pull it life back. first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, right. All right. Books that have influenced my professional life. I mean, a lot. But you know, so I I do this stuff on um, misinformation public belief, false belief, um, social network spread, but my actual discipline is philosophy. So oh. a lot of what I read is actually philosophy books, which, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, they're, they're not always for everyone. <laughs> so like the first things that pop to mind are, you know, these like very esoteric types of things like, I love David Lewis's work on what social conventions are, but mm. like, you hear what I'm saying? It's yeah. not that yeah. relevant here. As far as stuff relevant to the topic we've been talking about, um, T. Wynn's work on like games and gamification recently has been pretty fascinating. Uh, lately, what I've been reading tons and tons of are like, I'm trying to read all the books on how uh, our particular beliefs in a society influence the way we produce science because I'm working on a project relating to that. So I'm reading all this stuff about how like our beliefs about gender influence science and our beliefs about fat and, you know, uh, disability and race. And yeah, that, I don't, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean a huge, a huge, a huge, a huge topic, and very relevant for this podcast actually, because I mean the name of the podcast is um, paradigms and or well, paradigm, and it's it's often about the looking at the paradigms in which we work, and um, not just working within them, but actually looking at them, and um, and they do shift, <laughs> and they do shift, and and many of the conversations I've had have addressed questions just like that. You know, when one gets started in science, you often see it as something that's largely uninfluenced by um, politics and social society and so on, uh, and so that is just completely not true. <laughs> that is completely yeah, not true. yeah, yeah. In fact, it's quite deeply influenced and shaped by the people who are producing it and the way they've been raised and the culture they're existing in and all these factors. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, to then make a smaller leap from uh, books that have professionally influenced you to to uh, books that have influenced you more broadly, and maybe it's the same because philosophy does that, but. Um, does anything come to mind as, as books that have uh, that have influenced you in a more general way? Gosh, I am really like an obsessive reader. So this is like a stressful question <laughs> for me. I am just going to go for the first thing that pops up. I am have, I mean, for my entire adult life, been absolutely obsessed with Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. You know yes. this book? Yes, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, all, mean, all, the, all, the wedding, uh, all the wedding readings come from that book. <laughs> A lot of them do. Uh, but, I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful and so mm. deep. I mean, the part on, like, joy and sorrow, I go and read, like, every month or so. Yeah, I love that book. Oh, amazing. That's a great recommendation. I will I will definitely link that one here. Um, uh, last two questions. Firstly, just, a, just like a, you know, a call to action for the audience, I guess. I mean, if people want to look more into this stuff, 
uh, if they want to get more involved, if they want to find your work, anything, um, you know, any any words to share with uh, with the audience? If people are interested in things like um, misinformation and especially disinformation, there are good recent books. I mean, um, Network Propaganda by uh, and Kathleen Jameson is really great, for example. Uh, if people are interested in looking at my work, I have a website, kaylinoconnor.com. It's really easy to find. I am on Twitter, but I mostly just go on there to post like when students in our graduate program have gotten jobs and occasionally to ask questions to help me in my research. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what other sorts of resources might be useful or would people usually share uh yeah usually usually books maybe we can link your your own book would be a good idea yeah so i wrote a book on misinformation called the misinformation age with jim weatherall who's my colleague and also my husband um we talk a little bit about curation in there not very much most of the curation stuff we started developing later uh that book mostly uses network models so models where you um, represent a whole social network in a computer simulation and then try to look at how various information or ideas spread between people. So we use those and then a lot of like historical cases of false beliefs to try to understand various features of how people share information and where they go wrong. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll link that as well. Um, last one, I'll give you a prior warning. It is a big jump from <laughs> the topics that we've been talking about, but it's it's one that I always end with. Um, we talked a little bit about generative AI, and there's a lot of talk about um, the prospect of developing an AI superintelligence. Um, and my question is, if we were to create one and we had to pick a person, either past or present, to represent humanity to the <laughs> to the AI superintelligence, um, who should we pick? Oh, Dolly Parton, obviously. <laughs> oh, that's a great one. That's a great one. That's uh, it's definitely one that has not been said on this podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, very good. Are um, you just, just all around very lovable, you know? <laughs> uh, she is. She is. Uh, I have a funny story about Dolly Parton. But again, it's, it's one for a different time. Um, <laughs>